Good day, students. My name is Dr. Mary Ann. We are going to start 2021 CROC 1 year, June 30th. Please, if you have not watched the Ministry Book series video, you should watch it because it is arranged topic by topic, course by course. The years will require you to have knowledge in multiple courses to be able to answer one question. But I will simplify the, this today to the best of my abilities. So let's begin. <clears throat> After an X-ray examination of the tuberculosis clinic patient, he was diagnosed with tumor of the right lung. During the surgery, the surgeon removed the middle lobe of the patient's right lung. This lobe includes, so they removed the middle lobe of the right lung, and I think I explained this to you. This, um, as you can see, the right lung has three lobes, and the um, left lung has two lobes, and these are the bronchial or pulmonary segments. Yes, I can see their names. So the middle lobe has just two, which is the media and lateral. So you can see them here, yes. So that's why it will be a segment lateral and media. Do not make the mistake and choose media basal because the um, you don't have anything called media uh, media basal. You only have uh, the anterior basal and lateral basal in the right part of the lung. A three-year-old child has been brought to the pediatric department with a no closure of the anterior fontanel. At what age does it normally occur? So the anterior fontanel, what age? It would be the, the let's start from the posterior. The posterior uh, fontanel closes at two to three months of age, but the anterior fontanel closes after first year of life. So in the second year of life, you will not choose first year of life because first year of life is one to two, 12 months. So the anterior fontanel closes from 13 months above. So after first year of life, which is second year of life, okay? Not in the first year of life. Don't make that mistake. A man with tetanus develops acute respiratory failure. What type of respiratory failure develops in such cases? So we know that obstructive and restrictive, I've explained this in the pathophysiology uh, series, the link will be attached in the description box. We know this is uh, due to diseases like COPD. And um, in this case, the patient cannot expire air. And restrictive is more of the patient cannot inspire air. We see this in like sarcoidosis or restrictive disorders of the lung. But in this regulatory um, disorder of the lung, this is due to disorder in the nerve center that regulates respiration or the nervous uh, regulation. And we know tetanus travels retrogradely and damages motor uh, nerves. And your phrenic nerve is a motor nerve that supplies your diaphragm. So that's why they will present with acute respiratory failure. So disorder of this, this regulatory disorder of alveolar ventilation. In Van Gerke's disease, glycogen accumulation can be observed in the liver and kidney. This disease is caused by deficiency of the following exam. So we explain this in the biochemistry ministry book series. The link will be attached in the description box, but we can see the different types of glycogen storage diseases and the deficient enzymes. So type 1 will be glucose 6-phosphatase. So what are the deficient in glucose 6-phosphatase? <clears throat> A 14-year-old boy was diagnosed with Huntington's triad, barrel-shaped teeth, uh, keratitis, and deafness. This is characteristic of syphilis. Why? Because we can see syphilis has something called it. Um, in, in the pathomorphological series, we explain the different types of um, syphilis, primary, secondary, congenital syphilis. And I told you in congenital syphilis, it presents with this triad, intestinal keratitis, Huntington's teeth, and deafness. And that's how we go for syphilis. Oxygen supply of the skeletal muscles during the intensive work is often problematic because of compressed vessels and disrupted blood flow. What supplies muscle with oxygen in this case? So of course, it will be myoglobin. Myo means muscle and globin, yes? It will not be hemoglobin because hemoglobin is for um, the blood and is in the vessel and it supplies all, all um all tissues, but for the muscles specifically is myoglobin, yes? 
Hematocrit studies shows the following pattern of erythrocytes. We've explained this in details in the pathophysiology um, ministry book series. I think could be attached below. So you can see how did I what did I when you approach this kind of question, how do you approach it? When you hear a myeloid, I want you to think mostly of neutrophils. And you can see there's a lot of neutrophils, yes. All these are neutrophils from here to here are all about neutrophils. There's a lot of neutrophils. And when it's chronic, it means that there's a decrease in the mature neutrophil. Yes. So it will be chronic myeloid leukemia. Also, in chronic myeloid leukemia, it's very important you look at your basophil and eosinophil. Eosinophil will be increased because the normal is 2 to 5, and your basophil will be increased because the normal is 0 to 1%, so chronic myeloid leukemia. If a two-year-old woman came to the neurologist with complaints of loss of skin sensitivity on the right half of her face in the area of the lower eyelid, nasal arc, and upper lip, what branch of what nerve is damaged? So it's important for you to know that your trigeminal nerve, okay, it gives its, it, it's for sensation. So temperature, or if someone touches the face with a cutting and so on. So the V1 ophthalmic branch is this region, as you can see, the maxillary, lower eyelid, nasal arch, and upper lip, as you can see. So it will be the maxillary zone of the trigeminal nerve, mandibular branch. The facial nerve supplies the, mus the muscles of the mimic muscles, the mimic muscles. The trigeminal nerve also supplies the muscles you know, of the jaw, but specifically the muscle of mastication. Patients with vitamin B12 deficiency develop degenerative processes in the posterior and lateral columns of the spinal cord. In this case, the damage to the axon is caused by distorted formation of what, so it will be myelin. Why? Because you know that myelin, um, vitamin B12 is an important cofactor in the synthesis of myelin, as you can see, synthesis of, of myelin. And when in biochemistry, we talked about the vitamins and their respective reactions that um they that they serve as a cofactor so the it will be in the description box you cannot explain it here because it will take us a long time but if you have watched it you know that it is required as you can see so without vitamin b12 this reaction cannot occur you can see mining synthesis so that's why they will present with uh degenerative um processes in their spinal cord because they lack myelin during a surgery with application of inhalation, narcosis, and muscle, muscle relaxants, the, anesthesi the anesthesiologist noted rapid increase of the patient's body temperature to 43 degrees Celsius. What pathology developed in this patient? So the exact mechanism is not fully understood, but it's important for you to know there's something called um, malignant hyperthermia. It is um, due to anesthesia, succinylcholine, uh, stress, heat, or exercise. And it is, it, is, it is characterized by hypothermia, tachycardia, tachypnea, increased carbon dioxide, so on and so forth. So it will be hyperthermic syndrome. Yes, it will, it will not be overheating. It's hyperthermic syndrome. Yes, because syndrome is a list of symptoms. Yes, so hyperthermic syndrome. Don't make that mistake, okay? A person has been bitten by a snake, which led to asphyxia. And overheating is just overheating. Yes, but hypertonic syndrome, I told you, is a list of symptoms. So we have hypothermia, we have tachycardia, you know. So don't make that mistake, okay? A patient has been bitten by a snake, which led to asphyxia and hemoglobin in urine. A heterocyte hemolysis occurred in the blood. Toxic sick venom causes um, less lysolecit information. Uh, okay, it's important for you to know that, where is it? That your phospholipase 2 um, makes... Um, um, in the acts, you can see this, they act on lecithin molecule to make um, lysolecithin and fatty acid. And the fatty acid will go into the formation of um, maybe um, the production of, of, of maybe beta oxidation, yes. But lysolecithin is a detergent and hemolytic agent, so it lysis our regular cell. However, it's released in very small quantities, yes, so it's not uh, 
it's not dangerous and our body also would quickly remove this. But what happened is when uh, the venom of a, of a snake, especially the viper snake, contains lysine in very high quantity. So that's why when the snake bites this person, there'll be a lot of lysine. Um, lysolecithin and that will cause lice and um, to cause um lysis of a red blood cell which we present as hemoglobin in the urine erythrocyte what hemolysis <clears throat> before prescribing a protein prenatal nutrition to an a machiated patient the doctor has referred the patient for serum protein erythrophoresis this technique is based on the following physiochemical properties of protein. So it will be the presence of the charge because we explained it in physiology here yeah, that um, our blood plasma contains these proteins and you can separate it using erythrophoresis. And I told you it's very important for you to know that the way they are able to separate it is because of their charge. So they have different charges and that's how you can separate it. So the albumin part, the globulin part one and two, you can see their respective types, the um, beta and the gamma which are also known as immunoglobulins or antibodies. A duct must contain fats. What plastic function do they fulfill in this process? So it will be they are part of the cellular membranes. Why? Because look at your cell membrane. You can see your cell membrane consists of the hydrophilic head, which likes water, hydrophilic, yes, polar, and the hydrophobic part, which is fatty acids or let's say fats, yes. Why? So you can see that they are important in your cell membrane. Why not? Sorry. Why not cellular ion channels? Your channels in your in your in the in, in an organism is most is mostly proteinous in nature. So they will not be even your cellular receptors are mostly proteinous in nature. Your your pumps are mostly proteinous in nature. Glycocalyx, as the name implies, glyco. You can see what's like glucose. So it's not fat. Yes. During analysis, a medical lab scientist has additionally noted that the blood sample was obtained from a woman. What blood cell or what blood corpuscle have the structural characteristic that allowed them to make such a conclusion? So it will be the neutrophilic leukocyte. Because I told you in the biology series, the, the link will be in the diffusion box. I told you that your neutrophilic leukocytes, um, you can check for the presence of bad bodies or drumsticks. And a woman, a a healthy woman will have one drumstick or one body, and a healthy man will have no bad body and no drumstick. So that's how you'll be able to differentiate. Autopsy of the body of a person who died after an abdominal surgery revealed numerous thrombi in the veins of the rest of pelvis. Clinically, thromboembolism syndrome was registered. Where should the pathologist search for thromboemboli? So, of course, it would be the pulmonary artery. Why? Because it said here that there was thromba in the veins of the lesser pelvis. And we know that, um, let's use this picture first, that the veins of your lesser pelvis will all will drain into the inferior vena cava. Yes, veins, all veins in your lower, all veins below your, let's say below your, um, below your first rib. S would drain into your inferior vena cava and all vein from your head region to your neck would drain into your superior vena cava. So lesser pelvis is low, yes. So to drain into your inferior cava, cava your right ventricle will pump it through your um what, what are they pumping? So there's thromboembolism, yes. So some parts will break off and the right ventricle will pump it into your pulmonary artery. And that's why I show you this picture, because if you notice your pulmonary artery, you can see, or your pulmonary, the pulmonary trunk, then pulmonary artery. And you can see the pulmonary artery also divides into small, tiny, tiny branches. And then it will get to a point where this emboli will not be able to pass through this tiny pulmonary artery. Yes, and that can cause the death of this patient. So that's what the autopsy of the body of a person who died after the surgery. Okay, so the doctor should check the pulmonary artery because um, if there's a surgery and there's um, thromboembolism forming in the lower um, veins, one of the common complications is this um, embolism can break off and travel to the um, lungs um, via the pulmonary artery, and that's where they will cause asphyxia and the patient will die. <clears throat>
Bacteriology testing is one of the methods for lab diagnosis of diphtheria. To grow the colonies of C. diphtheria, it is necessary to know the proper condition for causative agent cultivation, what nutrient media are optimal for Cornubacterium diphtheria. So I told you in the microbiology series that I will explain in detail about um, isolative medium when you want to grow only a specific type of bacteria, yes. And we know for, for Cornubacterium diphtheria, it would be your blood terrorite agar. You can see that that is the only option that has the blood terrorite agar. As you you can see your blood terulite agar, cysteine terulite blood agar. You can see it is used to grow um, diphtheria, and they normally grow producing a metallic. Um, they are black with a metallic sheen. A patient was hospitalized in a common store state. The patient has a five-year long history of diabetes mellitus type two. Objectively, his respiration is noisy, deep, with acetone breath odor. When you say acetone, acetone Tone, acetone breath odor is characteristic of uh, ketoacidosis, yes. Oh, they also said here yeah, ketone body is um, 100 micromole per liter. So you can see that this is very high. So it will be ketoacidotic coma. That's what caused the state. But if they said that the glucose was, let's say, less than, um, the glucose was less than 3 or, let's say, 2.0, it will be hypoglycemic coma. Microside. Microslide and animal retina. Microslide of an animal retina shows numerous phagosome in the cell of its outer pigment layer. What function of pigment cell is most evident in this case? So they said they checked, they found numerous phagosome in the cell. And we know that phagosomes is to phagos phagocytize anything foreign to the body, so it will be protective function. The ophthalmologist noted a prevalent discharge from a conjunctiva of a newborn. Microscopy of the smell obtained from a conjunctiva found there to be a large number of leukocytes, as well as gram-negative diplococci located in the leukocyte. What is the causative agent? So what we know from the microbiology series that bean-shaped diplococci is unique for Neisseria species, so Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria cateralis. But why are we going for Neisseria gonorrhea? Because um, during delivery, a woman who has Neisseria gonorrhea of course, it's present in the vaginal cavity. If the baby passes through the vaginal cavity, there's risk or there is high risk of this Neisseria gonorrhea to enter the eye of this baby, yes, causing this disorder in the baby. Neisseria cateralis is um, a respiratory um, disease that occurs in children. So this is not respiratory, yes. So that's right to be Neisseria gonorrhea. A child has signs of delayed physical and mental development, cretinism. This condition is caused by the def deficiency of the following hormone. So no cretinism is due to deficiency of thyroid hormone. However, we are going to go for, um, we will go for, let's see, um, we can see, okay, it's very important for you, know, for you to know that Neisseria um, cataralis, also called Moraxella cataralis, yes. And look here. So we're going to, um, you can see that we have two thyroid hormone, T4 and T3. Now uh, you can see that um, T3 is less and T4 is more. However, T3 is the active form and it has the greatest uh, metabolic e effect, while T4 is not that effective. Normally, um, when T4 is secreted, T4 is what changes to T3. Yes, so that's why we're going to go for thyroxine because when someone has cretinism, they are unable to make thyroid hormone and it will be the first one they are able to make because you can't make uh, T3 without making T4 first. Yeah, so that's why it's be T4 we're going to go for and not T3. What drug is used for the treatment of malaria, amoebic dysentery, and autoimmune diseases? So um, we know that um, from our pharmacology from series that chigamine, also called chloroquine, is useful in malaria treatment. It also has anti hermetic function. And when it's autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, like um, collagenous diseases, that's of the collagen. So that's how we go for chigamine. And it's a malaria drug. All these other drugs here are not, they are not used in malaria. A man with heart failure presents with enlarged liver, leg edema, and ascites. What is the leading mechanism of edema formation? So heart failure, the man is unable to pump blood. To, so the blood that is in the vein, they, they won't be able to um, get into the heart 
to the and the heart will not be able to pump it, so the blood will remain in the vessel. So because of that, it's enlarged, there's increased fluid in the vessel. And when there's increased fluid in the vessel, it increases your hydrodynamic or hydrostatic pressure, and that will also cause edema. But we explain this in detail in the physiology. The link will be in the description box below. A patient is suspected to have infectious mononucleosis. What result of lab analysis can sum the diagnosis immediately on the day of hospitalization? So it is important for you that for you to know that infectious mononucleosis is mostly when they talk about it, they were mostly referring to Epstein Barr virus, but it's also caused by other viruses like cytomegalovirus and so on and so forth. But when they talk about infectious mononucleosis, they mostly refer to EBV, but I want you to know that it can be caused by other viruses. And um, I strongly recommend this video, any of this video. So maybe um, this video and any of the video that is here, all of them are very good. Um, it's important for you to know that everybody has this disease, this, this um, Everybody has had this disease, but it's mostly asymptomatic and we're able to fight it in our childhood time. So if you check the antibodies of most adults, you're going to find the presence of IgM antibodies to Epstein Barr virus. Most people are asymptomatic, but if uh, someone should present with an infect with symptoms, it will be called mono. Yes. So that has to be IgM antibodies to Epstein Barr virus. It will not be a four fold increase because um, they didn't specify which antibodies. Yes. So it will be IgM antibodies to Epstein Barr virus. A woman with chronic hepatitis complains of increased sensitivity to barbiturates that previously she could, she could take without any signs of intoxication. Her condition is mainly associated with the disturbance of the following hepatic function. So the answer would be, of course, it will be metabolic. Why? Because look, they said she had chronic hepatitis. So because of this chronic hepatitis, she's not able. We know that our liver, our liver um, detoxify um breaks detoxifies drugs or and breaks down toxic substances so we know um okay quick term let me differentiate three vessels we have the hepatic artery which supplies um blood to the to the it carries um it supplies blood to the heart but it is it doesn't have nutrients your portal vein carries blood to the heart Will I say, okay, let's start again. Your hepatic artery carries oxygen, very oxygenated blood, but it's very low in nutrients. Your portal vein carries not, it's not so um high oxygen in the in the in portal vein, but a lot of nutrients. Why? Because um a lot of nutrients, because this portal vein carries this um blood from your intestine, yes. And when you take drug, it goes to your intestine first. So then it goes to your liver through the portal vein, and your liver can break down this drug to decrease the effect of this drug. So if this person has chronic hepatitis, she cannot um, break down this drug or decrease the effect of this drug. That's why when she's taking this drug, she's having intoxication signs because she's she's not able to break down this drug or reduce the effect of these drugs. You understand? So that's why it's been metabolic. A person has retained taste sensation but overall sensitivity of the oral structure is lost this is due to what so we know that the um the trigeminal nerve innervates the taste sorry the trigeminal nerve um is for um, sensation for temperature hot and cold sensation in the tongue but anterior part anterior to third and the facial nerve is for taste anterior to third but your, your cranial nerve nine so pharyngeus is both taste and sensation in the posterior part. Now, they said there's loss of sensation, okay? If there's loss of sensation, what does that mean? It means that both your cranial nerve 9, because they didn't specify where, yes? So both your cranial nerve 9 and your trigeminal nerves could be affected. But however, they said here that this patient has retained taste, which is gustatory, but they didn't specify where. So we are also going to assume that if they have retained taste, they have retained taste in the anterior part, which is facial nerve, and they have retained taste in the posterior part, which is goes to pharyngeal nerve. So that means what will be damaged will be the trigeminal nerve. Does it make sense? Good. A 48-year-old woman with diabetes mellitus has been hospitalized um, due to severe pre-comatose states 
Analysis of acid base balance reveals metabolic acidosis. What primary mechanism caused the changes in this human acid base balance? So it will be the formation of under oxidized product because we know that um, when a healthy person can utilize or oxidize glucose fully or completely, but when this patient doesn't have um, when this patient has diabetes, they're unable to utilize glucose and then they start to metabolize other products. And these products are under oxidized. That is the primary mechanism. That's what changes the acid base balance. They don't want to tell you the formation of ketone bodies, yes. So it's also not the formation of under oxidized products. A long time taking of potassium preparation has caused hyperkalemia in the patient. This condition results in the following changes in the secretion. So this person is taking potassium for a long time. It's hyperkalemia. If you increase vaso, if you increase aldosterone, aldosterone will increase sodium reabsorption and decrease. Aldosterone will increase sodium reabsorption and excrete or remove potassium. So it makes sense that aldosterone will increase so that you can remove this hyperkalemia, you can remove this excess potassium that is in this patient's blood because she took um, potassium preparation for a long time. So it will be increased aldosterone. Why not vasopressin? Because vasopressin is just reabsorption of water. If there's decreased renin, there'll be decreased aldosterone, yeah? So that's why we're not going for that. A patient with myocardial infarction in the acute phase has been hospitalized in the cardiac unit. So induced lysis in this patient coronary vessel, so the following enzyme should be used in the early hours of infarction. So it will be streptokinase because this streptokinase has anticoagulative effects. Oh, sorry, let me rephrase. Streptokinase has anti um, anti-aggregating effect. So it's, it's used because it's said to induce platelet lysis. So these platelets are, as these platelets are already aggregated. So you need to break down this aggregate of platelets, this platelet um, plug. So it's a streptokinase. Lysozyme is um, phagocytic function in the saliva. Chemotrypsin and trypsin is the um, breakdown of protein. And hyaluronic days is um, the breakdown of, of hyaluronic acid, which is found in our collagen tissue. Yes, that's why um, when a patient has scurvy, which is deficiency of vitamin C, they're unable to inhibit um, hyaluronic days. And if they're unable to inhibit hyaluronic days, there will be a lot of breakdown of hyaluronic acid, which is in our collagen um, fibers. And if there's a breakdown of collagen fibers, there will be breakdown of like our collagen fibers are in our gum. So that's why they present with scurvy. Yes, bleeding gums. In reperfusion syndrome, the process of free radical oxidation activates, resulting in damage to cell membrane and disturbance of specific cell function. These changes are associated with excessive accumulation of the following ions in the cytoplasm. So uh, what you should know that when a cell in the heart, for example, when there is ischemia, let's say there's construction of a vessel, there is ischemia and some part of the cells are dying. What happens is um, they try to compensate or they try to fix this by dilating this um, vessel so that this vessel can be reperfused with oxygen. But there's a problem that arises. What you should know, what are the three mechanisms? Free radical damage, inflammation, and calcium ion influx. Um, what happens is um, when there is in there's um, due to ischemia, there is damage of mitochondria in this cell, and these cells are, un are unable to properly um, metabolize oxygen. So because of that, we're going to have incomplete um, oxygen meta uh, met metabol metabolizing or something, incomplete oxygen um, metabolites, yes. And this and this um, incomplete oxygen um, metabolizing or reduction will lead to the formation of radical oxygen species. And this radical oxygen species damage the protein and can cause mutation. Also, let me specify more on the calcium inflammation due to white blood cell that will be, that will be in inflammation, white blood cells will come there to engulf these dead cells, yes. And in calcium ion influx, remember that I told you that your cells have, in, the, in your cells, there's something called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and your sarcoplasmic reticulum stores calcium. Now, when the cell, 
starts to die, your sarcopathic reticulum is damaged and the calcium will be released. When you give this patient oxygen, the, um, the um, cells that, the, that were not dead or the cells that are now um, reperfused will have a lot of calcium. And because of this lot of calcium, there will be a constant hypercontracted state. So that's why the answer will be calcium ions. Yes? Because that's what it is. Yes, I think I explained it well. Autopsy of a of the body of a 42-year-old man who had chronic diffuse bronchitis and died of cardiopulmonary failure shows large hyperinflated lungs that cover the mediastinum with their edges. These lungs do not deflate, are pale gray, emits what crackling sound when caught. Pressing a finger to the surface of the lung leaves an indentation. Bronchial lumen produces mucopulent exudates. Make this diagnosis. So look, they already told you there's chronic diffuse bronchitis. So when there's chronic diffuse bronchitis, your bronchi are constricted. Air is unable to leave the lungs. So there's air trapping and that will cause hyperinflated lungs. And now they want you to know that it is diffuse because they already told you it's diffuse bronchitis. So you should know that the hyperinflated lung will occur in all parts of the lungs. So that's why it will be diffuse obstructive. It will be chronic because you're already your chronic diffuse bronchitis, of course, yes. And pulmonary emphysema. Emphysema is due to uh, damage of your elasticity of your alveoli and that will trap um, a, yes, let me show you a picture of emphysema. That's why you have that crackling sound when you cut, when you're cutting it. So you can see in emphysema, this is the normal alveoli, yes, and this is your bronchi. So if this bronchi are constricted, it will be hard for air to pass, to go out. So because of that, this um, alveoli will be, the elasticity will be destroyed and they'll be very big. And when you press, so when you press the person's chest, there'll be an indentation. So that's why it's a chronic diffuse pulmonary emphysema. It is not vicarious, but vicarious is due to when it's mostly seen in, a, in an organ that have a pair. So in your kidney, if you remove one kidney, the other kidney will undergo hypertrophy because so that it can compensate for that other um, kidney. Do you understand? So that's not what they're talking about here. Yes, they didn't remove any lung. Idiopathic means you don't know the cause, but here we already know the cause, diffuse bronchitis. Interstitial emphysema is only the alveola, but here they already talked about um, bronchitis, yes? So that's why it would be that. When a dentist applied hydrogen peroxide to the patient oral mucosa, it started frothing excessively. What enzyme breaks down hydrogen peroxide? So we all know that catalase breaks down hydrogen peroxide, and in doing so, there will be um, a foam or a bubble will be produced. So that's why they said froth, frothing, so like foam or bubbles. On examination, a man presents with convergence trabismus, inward deviation of the eyeball, inability to move the eye outward. So he cannot move the eyeball outward or he cannot abduct the eye. What nerve is damaged? Abducens. So look here. You can see this is, you can see both here, this is like normal. So convergent, the eye is coming towards the nose side because the the person cannot abduct the eye, so um, this part, if the person cannot abduct the eye, the media rectus, which brings the eye towards the midline, will be running unopposed. And in divergent, it means that the media um, rectus is damaged, so the rectus, um, the lateral rectus will be running unopposed, so that's why you have divergent strabismus. A patient complaints of acute increase that's how you have what? What did I say here? Divergent shall business, okay. A patient complains of acute increase in diuresis. Examination reviewed secretion of vasopressin in this patient. Reviewed decreased secretion of vasopressin in this patient. What cells have insufficient secretory activity in this case? So I always explain this thing every time to everybody. I tell you that, okay, your hypothalamus, yes, this is your hypothalamus up here. Your hypothalamus produces statins or libellins. Libellins are also known as releasing hormone. So they will come to your anterior pituitary to tell your anterior pituitary to release what? Let's take, for example, somatolibellin. So somatolibellin or somatotropic, somatotropic releasing hormone will come to your anterior pituitary and tell your anterior pituitary to release somatotropin 
also known as what somatotropin stimulating hormone. But your hypothalamus makes oxytocin an antidiuretic hormone, okay? Then stores it in your posterior pituitary. Yes, your posterior pituitary is also known as what? Neurohypophysis. So that's why it will be neurosecretive of the hypothalamus because it's your hypothalamus that makes antidiuretic hormone. It's not your posterior pituitary that makes antidiuretic hormone. That's why this person has increased diuresis because the neurosecretory of the hypothalamus is not is is insufficient, so it's not making antidiuretic hormone. If you're not making antidiuretic hormone, which is known as vasopressin, you are unable to reabsorb water. If you're unable to reabsorb water, you you will excrete a lot of water. If you, that means what increased urination, also known as increased diuresis. A 17-year-old girl undergoes examination. She has signs of pharyngitis, lymphadenopathy, neck of the neck, fever, and was diagnosed with infectious mononucleosis. What tests can be done? So, of course, IgM antibodies to Epstein-Barr virus. Now, I also, if you have watched that video, you know that the classic sign of infectious mononucleosis is pharyngitis, lymphadenopathy, and fever. After thorough examination, also, I should also tell you that um, your Infectious mononucleosis, especially the Epstein Barr virus, is also known as the kissing uh, disease. What is known as the kissing bug, triatoma um, bug, yes. And I think that's what causes Chagas disease. Yeah, Chagas disease. So, okay. No, I'll explain it here now. After thorough examination, a man has returned to Ukraine from Central Asia, was professionally diagnosed with summer shrink encephalitis. In such case, the cholesterol agent is transmitted via the bite of a certain arthropod. Now, when cross presents you with tick questions, I want you to know that tick, um, different kinds of tick, because you have Ixodes percartius, Ixodes ricinius, Ododos papilius, all these ticks, especially the heart ticks, they are everywhere, almost everywhere. And it's, it's not like, it's not the way you have a specific type of tick in Africa and a specific type of tick in America. No, they are almost, they are the same almost everywhere. However, when you want to approach this question, you should use the disease. Spring summer encephalitis, also known as brain encephalitis, is caused by um, heart tick, but more specifically to the Ixodes ricinius. Now look at this photo here. You see, that precarious causes was um tag tiaga disease. So you can see that um Lyme disease is also caused by is also caused by both incidence resinous and precarious. Yes, so you should use this to able to identify the question. Now, if it's a soft tick known as autonidus papillus, it causes what relapsing fever. So that's why it's um incidence resinous. Patient process in cardiomyocytes has been studied in an experiment. It was determined that during the phase of their rapid depolarization, sodium ions can additionally move in through, of course, the calcium channels because we did this in physiology, yes. We see here. Where is it? Oh, I just removed something. Okay, I don't think I put it here, but we know that. Uh, okay, let me show you. Caution. Here, see this picture. We explained this in um, physiology series. Yes, we can see that in the rapid depolarization. Yes, we have both calcium and sodium. Yes, um, so that's why it's with calcium channels. Increased resistance to blood ejection from the left ventricles has activated the homometric compensation mechanism in the patient. In what pathological process can this compensation mechanism develop in this left ventricle? So the already told there's increased resistance to the ejection of blood from the left ventricle. And we know it will be aortic valve stenosis. Why? Because look at this heart. This is your aortic valve. If there is stenosis, this heart, the left ventricle, will have to contract harder and it undergo hypertrophy just so that it can push this blood into the aorta against this stenosed aortic valve. Yes, it makes sense. So that's why it would be aortic valve stenosis. During a surgery, a surgeon manipulating the area between the stomach and the liver where 
were, and the liver were extremely careful to avoid damaging the hepatoduodenal ligament because it contains what? So you all know why. You should know that this lesser omentum forms these two ligaments. Yes, the hepatoduodenal ligament um, contains what? The bile duct, proper hepatic artery, and hepatic portal vein. Yes, so that's why it will be common bile duct, hepatic artery, and hepatic portal vein. A patient with essential hypertension with prescribed a thiazide. What mechanism of drug action facilitates a decrease in blood pressure in this case? So we know that this thiazide acts in the proximal convoluted tube to inhibit the passive reabsorption of sodium ions and water. So if you if this thiazide inhibits the reabsorption of sodium ions and water, it means that this sodium ions and water will be excreted in the urine. So that is how they decrease blood pressure by increasing the excretion of sodium ions and water. Yes, good. An older man with Parkinsonism was prescribed a certain drug. Several days later, the man developed complaints of dry mouth and rapid heart rate. The prescribed drug is a what? So it will be a colino blocker or a muscarinic blocker because you should all know that a muscarinic um, blocker like atropine, these are one of the uh, side effects. Dry mouth, tachycardia, because if you block parasympathetic, which is muscarinic, sympathetic will run on a pulse, so that's why you have tachycardia. Blurring of vision, uh, glaucoma, all these things, yes? So that's why it's be, um, because you should you anywhere in crop see dry mouth and rabbit heart you should always think of a colino blocker or atropine, which is a muscarinic blocker, the same thing, yes? So that's why it's with that. During patient examination, the doctor conducts auscultation to assess the function of the mitral valve. Where can the tones of this valve be auscultated? So it will be the cardiac apex. That's why I wanted to show you this picture, yes? So your aortic valve is heard in your second intercostal space, right of parasternal line or the right side, you know, parasternal. Your pulmonary um, valve is heard in the in the second intercostal space, this picture is not so correct, yes. It's heard in the second intercostal space, left parasternal line. Your bicuspid, let's use this, please. The the bicuspid or the mitral valve is heard at the heart apex and the tricuspid valve is heard at the base of this different process, yes. So because of mitral valve, also known as the bicuspid, it would be the cardiac apex. The synthesis rate of DNA, RNA, are necessary and necessary proteins are decreased in the cell of a human body, and mitotic activity is insignificant. These changes most likely correspond with the following ontogenetic period. So, you know, ontogenetic period begins from zygote stage to old age. So, in what state do you think the DNA of the rate of synthesis of DNA, RNA, and protein will decrease? Of course, to be in old age, yes. Not death, because the ontogenic period do not include the death period. It's only from zygote stage to old age. To assess their adaptation to physical exertion, the doctor has examined the workers after severe workload. What changes in the complete blood count will be detected? So there's physical exertion. And then um, he examined the workers after the severe workload. What changes will you see in the complete blood count? So it will be redistributive leukocytosis. It will not be a decrease in leukocytes. It will be an increase in leukocytes, but the increase in leukocytes is relative. Okay, it's not due to intensification of leukopoiesis. It's just due to redistribution. Yes, so they can change it to relative leukocytosis. To study hypoxia, a test animal was given potassium cyanide solution. What type of oxygen starvation develops in this case? So I think we explained this so perfectly in the physiology lecture. This is one of my favorite topics. Yes, we explained the types of hypoxia and what you should look for. But we know that the histotoxic hypoxia, also known as tissue hypoxia, is when the tissues or the cells cannot utilize oxygen. And the causes are cyanide poisoning because they block this enzyme and vitamin B1 deficiency or very, very... Um, um, very, or very, very, yes. So that's why the answer will be tissue. A man is a carrier of AIDS virus. That is an RNA virus. This 
The cell of this patient synthesized via DNA, this process is based on, we know that DNA to RNA is transcription, yes. However, this um, HIV or AIDS virus, they have RNA, but they are synthesizing DNA, so they are going the reverse. So if DNA to RNA is transcription, DNA to, if DNA to RNA is transcription, yes, where is it? If DNA to RNA is transcription, because um, this virus has RNA and they're trying to make DNA, so they're going from RNA to DNA, so it will be what's reverse transcription. ECG of a patient shows increased duration of QRS complex. What is the cause? So we know that the QRS complex is due to ventricular depolarization or ventricular excitation. So it will be increased period of, because they say increased duration, so it will be increased period of ventricular excitation or depolarization. Significant exposure to radiation cause changes in the body resistance, suppression of phagocytosis, so on and so forth. What kind of infection would develop? So it will be auto-infection. Why? Because look, mono-infection is an infection caused by only one pathogen. Mixed infection is an infection caused by uh, the same, um, it's caused by different, it's caused by more than one pathogen, but of the same species. So example, hepatitis B and hepatitis D. Yeah? We explained this in one of the um, series um, video. Auto-infection is due to, um, these um, bacteria are already in your body and they infect you maybe due to dysbiosis or due to radiation. Reinfection is after you have recovered from this um, pathogen, this same pathogen infects you again. Then super infection is when you are infected with a disease, let's say for example, um, hepatitis, and then later on you get, let's say HIV, yeah? so that's super infection. So it will be auto-infection. You mostly see it in case of dysbiosis and radiation due to opportunistic infection, yes? During an outbreak of a hospital-acquired infection, pure culture of staph aureus were obtained upon inoculation from the nasopharyngeal um, space. Um, they're asking you what analysis must be conducted to find the likely source of infection. So it will be phage typing of obtained culture. Why? Because you should just know the definition. You should know that phages, which is in microbiology series, they infect bacteria. And um, this phage they are very selective. They affect a particular type of bacteria. So if you want to check the origin or the source, what did they say? If you want to check the source of the infection, the next the next step to, to check is phage typing because you can identify the particular phage, you can identify the, the particular source. There's the phage typing of the obtained culture. So anywhere you see to find the source of infection, your answer will always be phage typing. What is used as an antidote with poisoning with sort of heavy metal. So it's unitol, also called this. We explained in the pharmacology lecture, we gave a list of poisoning and their antidotes, yes. If a deceased young woman with angioneuritic edema was prescribed an H1 blocker with antispasmodic sedative and local anesthetic action, select the H1 blocker from the list. So it would be Dimedro, look here. We have um, antihistamines, yes. First generation, second generation, what's the difference? First generation has sedative effect and second generation do not have sedative effect. That is why there's some questions you see in Croc that Croc will talk about uh, a patient that is four years, like seven years old, or a patient that's attending school, a patient that is working, and you need to prescribe an antihistamine. So you have to give a second generation because they don't have sedative effect. So the patient will not be sleeping, you understand? But if you want to prescribe a, an antihistamine with sedative effect, you have to give the first generation. So we can see here that diphenyldramine is also called, it's known as what? Dimedro. So that will be our answer. Thank you very much. If you like this video, if I explain something that you didn't understand, please, you can show your appreciation by subscribing, liking, and please, very important, comment. Thank you very much. And I wish you good luck in your crop preparation.